This past Friday, Silicon Valley Bank, SVB, was taken over by the federal government. And yesterday, Sunday, the government announced that it was going to make all its depositors whole, even those that had more than $250,000 FDIC insurance limits at the bank. In this video, we're going to talk about what happened and what we can learn from it. Hey everybody, my name is Rob Berger. This is the Financial Freedom Show where we talk about investing, retirement, and financial freedom. If those topics are of interest to you, I encourage you to subscribe to the channel. I also send out a, a free a newsletter every Sunday morning. You can subscribe to the newsletter with the link below this video. So what I want to do today is cover four things. One, what, what exactly or who was or what is SVB, Silicon Valley Bank? What's their story? What in the world went wrong? What did the government then do about it? And I think most importantly, what can we as investors learn from the mistakes, and they were significant mistakes, that the management of SVB made. Now, I should point out that another bank in New York, Signature Bank, also uh, was, was taken over by the uh, government, in this case, uh, the state of New York, and the depositors of that financial institution will also be made whole. Uh, but today's video, I want to first focus on and primarily focus on SVB, because I think we can learn a lot from what happened. So first of all, question one, Silicon Valley Bank, what's it all about? So this is actually their website, and we'll, uh, I'll leave links to everything I'm showing you below the video. And they were the, uh, the bank of the tech startup scene. You can see here the financial partner of the innovation economy. They're scrolling through here a number of the, the companies that they've worked with. And so basically, venture capitalists would fund these startups. That money would end up in, in SVB. And uh, so it was known as a very innovative uh, bank. And it was a very fast growing bank. As we'll see, its return on equity was, was quite high as banks go. And you can see here they had, uh, as of the fourth quarter of last year, $212 billion in assets. So I believe that made them the 16th largest bank. I could have that off by one or two, but they were uh, somewhere in there, certainly not a Chase or a Bank of America or Wells Fargo. But, but at the same time, a very large financial institution. And at, from an investor's perspective, many regarded it as a, a very sound investment. I, I will say that last year, its stock performed very poorly. Of course, it was a rough year for a, a lot of investments. It had gained some of that back this year. But here's a 2020, I believe 21, yes, article from The Motley Fool that sort of gushed over the uh, SVB. You see here, whether you look at loans, deposits, fee income, or profits, this bank is simply running at a higher, more consistent pace. And more recently, Jim Cramer, uh, this is just a month ago, at 320 bucks a share then, he was saying this is a, a good buy. So Jim Cramer, even just a month ago, was singing the praises of SVB, and of course, that raises the big question, well, what did what did he miss? Well, what did investors miss? This took a lot of folks by surprise. I don't pretend to have had any insight into this, not that I'd been focusing on SVB before the past week, but what went wrong? And the seeds of the problem were planted actually during the pandemic, because remember, the pandemic hit, the federal government just flooded the economy with, with basically free money. Uh, uh, interest rates were effectively at zero, there was a lot of investment in tech companies and a, and a lot of that investment in the form of deposits poured into SVB. And we can actually look at the numbers. This is from a, a site called Macro Trends. Uh, th this blue, the blue uh, lines represent on the chart re represent total assets on a, on a quarterly basis for SVB. And I wanna show you right here. This is March of 2020, right? So this is the start of, of, of the pandemic. And you can see here, I can try to make this maybe a little, maybe a little bigger for you. They were at $75 billion. And each, so each bar, each of this chart represents a quarter. So the next quarter, just in three months, they went from 75 to 85 billion. They gained 10 billion in assets uh, in one quarter, then 96, almost 97 billion, 115. I mean, they were jumping by significant amounts quarter over quarter. They topped out, uh, at um, $220 billion, that would have been, let's see, in, in March of last year. And then they started to trail off a little bit. But here was, the, here was the issue. This really planted the seeds of the problem because management at the bank had a problem. The problem is, what in the world do we do with all of this money that's coming in? Uh, certainly we wanna make loans, 
but we want to make sound loans, right? That are that have good credit risks, and 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 we want to you know obviously protect our asset base, protect our investors, and so we don't want to make reckless loans. Uh, and then what do we do with money even beyond that? How do we earn some kind of return on all of the the money that's pouring into the bank? And here's where the problem set in. They decided to invest in a lot of the money in long duration bonds. Now, wh why did they do that? Well, again, going back a year or so, uh, before the rates started to rise, as we all know, interest rates were effectively at zero. They were a classic mistake reaching for yield. And they did that by investing in long duration bonds, as we'll see. Now, the yields then weren't great. I've, I've seen it reported that their average yield was around 175 basis points, 1.75%. Of course, back then, yeah, maybe not so bad compared to, say, near 0% on short-term bonds, but it exposed their portfolio to significant interest rate risk, as we've talked about on this channel many times. As interest rates rise, the value of existing bonds go down, and that's exactly what happened. And let me show you. We are looking uh, at their most recent uh, 10Q. They hadn't filed their annual report yet for 2022. So the two rows I want to focus on are available for sale securities, this row right here, may be a little difficult to see, uh, 26.7 billion, and held to maturity securities, 93.2 billion. That was as of September 30th of, of last year. So uh, available for, secure, for sale securities, as the name suggests, these are securities that they may sell to cash. Held to maturity, the idea is we're, gonna, we're not going to sell these. We're going to hold them, and when they mature, they mature. Now, for our purposes, the distinction is important because uh, when you classify uh, an investment as available for sale, you report it, and let's assume it's gone down in value, you report it on your balance sheet at the current value. Uh, so, for example, these available for sale securities on the balance sheet are uh, valued at $26.7 billion, even though they cost the bank $29.5 billion. So they've lost about $3 billion dollars on these investments, and it's reflected here because they've, they, they're reporting the lower amount on their balance sheet. Held to maturity securities are accounted for differently under the rules. You do not mark them down to their current value. You can actually keep them on, your, on, on the books at your cost. So they're held to maturity securities, 93 billion. That's what it's reported on their balance sheet, but we can see here the fair value, look at this, 77 billion. So they've lost about what over about 16, not quite 16 billion dollars in these what appear to be safe bond investments, even though again, they don't have to report that loss yet. It's it's reflected here, but on the balance sheet, they're still showing it at 93 billion. What's interesting about that number is if we scroll down and look at their total equity, it's right down here. Again, I know it may be a little hard to read, but it's 15.8 billion dollars. If they were to actually mark to market those held to maturity uh, uh, investments, these are pr primarily bonds, a lot of mortgage-backed security bonds, it would have wiped out their total equity. It would have actually gone slightly uh, negative. So, so what they did, trying to reach for yield, they invested in long-duration bonds. If we could, we could actually dig into the 10K, what we would find out is that for their held to maturity securities, a lot of them, the, the vast majority, uh, maturities were 10 years or or longer. So management wanted to reach for yield at, at a time when interest rates were near zero. They invested a lot of money in these longer duration bonds. They took on this interest rate risk and well, they got hammered. Interest rates, as we know, have gone up significantly. As we just saw, they're $93 billion in bonds, now only worth 77 billion. Now here's the thing. That by itself did not cause uh, the, the run on the bank and for the, the federal government to, to close that bank and take, take that bank over. What happened? Well, their deposit growth slowed significantly. And in fact, as we saw just a minute ago, uh, here we go, their total assets, you know, were going up 10, 20 billion a quarter. I think they were probably getting used to that. And then uh, the 0% the rate environment changed and whoops, everything just came to a screeching halt. In fact, total assets started to go down. They had these investments on their books at, at, at frankly, a, a significantly higher amount than their true value. 
And so what the bank decided to do, ironically, it was to appease uh, depositors, make them feel you know, that, the, you know, that the bank was solid, appease investors. They sold some of their uh, bond investments, about, uh, ended up taking about a $1.8 billion loss on a sale of about $21 billion in bonds. They issued more equity, raised more equity capital, and they also sold some convertible bonds. The idea was, we're gonna we're gonna pull in all of this cash, and that'll make the depositors feel secure and investors. Well, it turns out it had the opposite effect. Venture capitalist firms saw all this happening. They had clients uh, that, that they were investing in that had their money at SVB, and they got nervous. So last week there was a classic run on the bank, and the, the VC said to their portfolio clients, "Get your money out." And so there was a run on the bank. Uh, they started pulling out a lot of money from the bank and that forced the, the government to come in, step in, take over the bank, close it down on, on Friday. But again, it all stemmed from bank management taking a huge risk in reaching for yield with long duration fi uh, fixed income securities. Interest rates went up and they took huge, huge losses that if you mark to market, effectively wiped out uh, the, the, the equity reported uh, on uh, their balance sheet. So what did the government do? Well, as we, we noted, uh, they came in Friday, took over the bank. Now at that point, uh, those folks, you know, uh, the, the depositors had $250,000 worth of FDIC insurance. I kind of chuckle as I say that because these startups had millions of dollars at the bank, much of which was going to be used to pay their employees. So they were they far exceeded the two hundred and fifty thousand dollar FDIC limit, and over the weekend there was a, a lot of uh, chatter in, in the news, social media, saying, "Look, the government has to step in and make the depositors whole, even those that have more than two hundred fifty thousand. If you don't do that, government, this is what many were saying, uh, there's going to be a pretty significant run on on other banks." starting today, because you know companies have more than $250,000 at a lot of banks, they're gonna have a, a fear that the same thing will happen at their bank, and there's gonna be a, a pretty uh, significant run on banks across the country. So what did the federal government eventually do? Well, we can actually look at it. Again, I'll link to all of this. Here is the joint statement. It comes from uh, the Department of the Treasury, the Federal Reserve, and the FDIC. And the long story short is they came in and said, look, we're, we're going to classify uh, SVB and Signature Bank as, as uh, representing what they call systemic risk. In other words, uh, the risk isn't con contained just to these two banks. If we don't do something, it's going to carry over into the banking system as a whole. And therefore, we, what we're going to do is we are going to pay out all depositors all of the money they had at the bank, even if it exceeds the FDIC insurance limit of $250,000. Now, I don't want to get into the politics of all of this, but it's, it's always part of a story like this, because then you get some folks saying, wait a minute, you're bailing out a private party. You shouldn't do that. Now, so what the government has said in response to that is, look, we're not bailing out shareholders. If you were an investor in SVB, you've lost all your money. We're not bailing out, for the most part, bondholders. Right? I mean, they may at some point get some of their money back. Uh, they stand before uh, stockholders, before equity. But we're not going to bail out bondholders. We're here for the depositors. And they say, it's not going to come from taxpayers. We're going we're gonna, to, uh, whatever the bill turns out to be, we're going to levy that, the FDIC is, against all the other uh, member uh, banks. So that, that's sort of their strategy, if you will, for convincing folks, look, this is not a traditional bailout like we saw, say, in 2008. I don't want to really get into the politics of it. You'll have your views on it, uh, whether this was a good or bad thing. For our purposes, that's what the federal government did. So if you have money at SVB or Signature Bank, it should be available to you, in fact, starting today. All right, so that's what SVB is. That's what went wrong and what the government did about it. For me, the real interesting thing is what can we as investors take away from all of this? And I think there are three sort of three broad things. The first is we need to keep reminding ourselves that every investment has risk. That, and that's true if you're putting your money in U.S. government bonds. In the case of S, uh, SVB, a lot of their money was in mortgage-backed securities. 
But every investment, no matter how safe it is, and we often hear bonds are safer than, than stocks, which really means they're less volatile. Generally, that's true. But every investment, even ones that are marketed as safe, have some risks. That's point one. Point two, more specific to bonds, as we've talked about, there are really two big risks when it comes to fixed income investments. One is what's called credit risk, the risk that the borrower won't pay you back. Now that really wasn't in play here. Uh, SVB management, uh, they weren't putting their the money in junk bonds. They weren't putting it in, in emerging market government debt. They were putting it from a credit perspective, uh, at least from what I've seen, in very uh, secure bonds. But there's a second risk, again, we talk about it a lot on this show, interest rate risk. And when you invest in long dated bonds, in this case, they were invested uh, a majority in, in, in bonds that mature 10 years or longer, you are taking on significant interest rate risk. All that means is as interest rates rise, the value of your bonds, which are, are paying lower rates, well, they go down. And if interest rates rise quick, uh, a lot and quickly, as we've seen over the last year, the value of a, of a long dated uh, bond can go down significantly. And that is exactly what happened at SVB as we saw a $93 billion bond portfolio reduced to about 77 billion, all in the course of just a few months. I mean, it was really dramatic. If you go back and look at a few older quarterly 10 Qs, uh, you know, you'll see that loss getting more and more up until almost 16 billion in their latest uh, quarterly filing that we looked at just a minute ago. The third thing uh, that I think we should always remember is that Yes, the government stepped in and decided to pay 100% uh, of the depositors' money, including any that exceed the FDIC insurance limits of $250,000. Now, I know a lot of you, you may not have $250,000 uh, in cash. Uh, good problem to have, right? But I also know that a lot of you do because you email me and you tell me. I've, got, I've had people email me and say they put a million dollars in a certificate of deposit. Here's the, the, the third and I think important takeaway. We shouldn't assume that the government will bail out all depositors at all bank failures going forward. In fact, I think we should assume that they won't and we need to act accordingly. So if you have a lot of money that you wanna keep secure, there are ways to do that, right? There are ways to get more than $250,000 in FDIC insurance. And in fact, I'm gonna talk about that in my very next video that I'll have later out this week, how to get more than $250,000 in FDIC insurance. It's actually qu quite easy. But, but that's one thing you, you can do. A simple way would be to open up multiple accounts at different banks, but there are other ways to do it as well. You could also invest in brokered CDs, say through like a Fidelity or, or Vanguard. You might, uh, you would avoid having more than $250,000 uh, in, in the same CD at a bank, but through brokered CDs, say at a Fidelity, you could open up multiple uh, CDs all at different banks, but do it all through Fidelity so you can manage it uh, all at one place. There are money market funds. Of course, there are just treasury bills. So there are ways to deal with the risk, but I think it's really important that we don't look at what happened with SVB and I guess Signature Bank as well, and just assume that the federal government's gonna step in and protect all depositors, regardless of amount in all future bank bailouts. In fact, I think we should assume the opposite, that they will not do that and protect ourselves accordingly. Well, there you go. That's my take on the whole situation at SVB, what happened, what the government did, and some things that we can learn about it. Uh, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. I'll do my best to help you out any way I can. And until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom.